Okay, good afternoon. Um, hope everybody's well in these crazy times. Uh, uh, we're very excited to have all the top agents from Excel as available to us for at least a short period of time this afternoon so we can talk about professional sports and the setting of this uh, crazy pandemic. My name is uh, David Alchek. I'm a sports medicine surgeon at the Hospital for Special Surgery and um, you know, very involved with athletic medicine and obviously very concerned about what's going on. So uh, maybe everybody should introduce themselves. I'm Jeff Schwartz. Um, started Excel in 2002 and uh, a partner and uh, president of Excel. I'm Casey Close, uh, a partner at Excel. I joined Jeff in 2011, um, been a baseball agent, run the baseball division at Excel, and been a player representative in baseball for nearly 30 years. Mark Steinberg, um, worked with my proud partners here uh, for about 28 years, but uh, rejoined in 2011, the same time as Casey. Um, and. Uh, head up our, our golf uh, practice and some of our uh, corporate business. So as, as you can all see, we have this incredible lineup of uh, sophistication uh, between Major League Baseball, the NBA, and uh, the PGA Tour. So uh, I don't know who wants to go first, but maybe we could talk about, you guys can give your view where we are in this pandemic in terms of returning your sport whoever wants to jump first go ahead Jeff why don't you lead since you started this whole thing okay uh, so I'll start off talking about the NBA um, and I think there's some similarities with uh, baseball and maybe golf's a little bit different but the NBA is still waiting to see if they can finish this current season um, they're going to wait as long as possible based basically waiting for better testing uh more access to testing and then a big issue is location if they are to finish the season how would they go about doing it and where would they go about doing it and there's a a number of factors that go involved uh that involve both the uh locations um and whether it would be one city or multiple cities I think at this time, the league is leaning towards a one or two city idea, um, but there's still so many logistics that need to get worked out. One of the biggest being, if you bring the players together and you bring the, call it essential people to make uh, games work, how do you house them? How do you make them not feel like they're, um, they're trapped where they're staying? I think the league would not want to do something where guys were players and officials uh, and, and team personnel and uh, TV personnel and arena workers where everybody was put into a hotel and told they couldn't leave a hotel for two, you know, for two months. So they're trying to figure out better ways from a, from a logistics standpoint to have something work. I think that if we don't have a decision by sometime late May or early June, um, on moving forward it's going to be tougher because then you're going to run into a situation of when do you start the next season um trying to finish this current season uh, i will just jump in on the baseball side so similar to jeff our sport is um trying to work through a number of these issues uh major league baseball was just in the middle of their spring training when this uh, announcement was made and everything broke away so the players have disbanded their camps. They've all gone back home. Um, they're spread throughout the country or throughout the world based upon where their home address is. Um, we are going through a number of different plans right now, looking at the things that are you know, possibly even actionable. Uh, testing remains at the forefront, similar to all the different sports, the ability to test, to know what they can do if in fact one of the athletes were to become positive or they start back up. Uh, given that our season did not start um, and baseball is more or less considered a marathon and not a sprint, the real decision here comes to about how many games are we going to be able to play and when will we be able to start. Um, 
given that baseball is 162 games, I think most players and even uh, ownership feel that, you know, they'd like to try to get in at least half the season to make it a legitimate season. So that would be 81 games. Um, they're trying to work through when the logistics of that would have to start and naturally when, um, when that would have to end at some point because baseball most likely would be an outdoor sport for most of the summer. Uh, fans, it looks like, uh, are not going to be part of this process until later in the summer, early fall, if at all. So those logistics are trying to be worked out, as are the logistics with regard to um, the players and where they would start the games. Uh, there's been some talk about maybe starting them in spring training, both in Arizona and Florida. Um, there's also been talk that the players would just start at their home parks with no fans, where the, the New York teams or the Boston teams or the Los Angeles teams would just open the season in their home parks and they would play different sorts of uh, games and sets. So I think the thing about baseball this year, which you certainly would never expect, is it will be altered uh, and it will be different than what we've seen before. There will be a different version of it, hopefully, if we can get these games together. Uh, but we're probably going to know a lot more in the next two to three weeks as we get a little closer to the summer, but most importantly, get more knowledge about our testing. Doc, you can probably appreciate, you know, the, Jeff and Casey and I have daily calls um, multiple times a day, and a, a lot of it is just to check in, but also best practices. And, uh, you know, golf looks like they might be one of the, we might be one of the first sports back. Um, we are intending to come back uh, the week of June 8th in Fort Worth, Texas at the Charles Schwab Colonial. Uh, and, um, you know, in, in, in talking with the, the, the management of the tour, uh, they have a lot in place to, uh, to uh, they have a lot in place currently to get this started the week of June 8th. They still have a lot to do, um, whether it's, um, you know, making sure testing protocols are in place, making sure that they're not taking tests away from the general public, um, how do you take the traveling caravan from week to week? Uh, so all of that is being worked out right now, but the intention right now is to, uh, to come back the week of, uh, the week of June 8th. There's going to be two charity matches, uh, you know, leading up to that. Uh, next Sunday is, uh, uh, a Rory McElroy, uh, inspired, uh, event that will take place at Seminole. And then, we at Excel are putting on a, uh, a major. That's my dog. Charlie. Um, we are putting on a uh, uh, a major charity event uh, with Tiger Woods, uh, Mickelson, Tom Brady, and Peyton Manning, um, and uh, all of it going to COVID relief. So um, golf seems to be at the forefront. Uh, David, I'll, I'll just jump in for one second on basketball and baseball. A big issue for us um, is going to be fans, fans back in arenas. Um, and the league, this, the NBA, I can speak for the NBA. Yes, we can do it this year without fans if, if the decision is made to try to go forward. Season. But in the big picture for next year, it's going to be really difficult. Um, and it, for the, the economic model, doesn't work unless you can get fans back in arenas. And that's going to be a big question of how, how to do that. Um, yeah, that was you, you, pretty typical of you, Jeff. You, you thought of my next question right away. That's what I was going to ask. Um, so that brings up, you know, you know, we might as well talk about the economics a little bit. Um, how are the, what are the TV networks? Are they, what are they saying? They're dying for content, right? Uh, so aren't they, they'd be willing to make up to bridge that difference between the teams not getting the gate revenue and the existing TV contract, or they're just going to stick to their existing TV contracts or maybe even cut them down. Where, where do the TV networks seem to be leaning on this? Case you want to jump in and then I'll go on. on. Sure. Go ahead. Sure. Um, I, I think the, the networks are starved for content, David. You hit the, the, the right on the mark. I think they do want to have access for any live programming they can get. I mean, people are starved for sports. Uh, I know baseball would love to jump out for that this summer. Um, you know, one of the things that will be important, though, is where those games are played and the times that are played. Obviously, they're, they're going to want to make sure 
that from a you know a content and and delivering on that you know you have prime time games that are available like to watch games at five in the morning or whatever the case might be i mean there's not going to be a whole lot of need for that so i, I do think that they're um, the value of those games, um, I, you know, to be determined whether the networks or the, the networks uh, all, all together feel like they'll make up some of those differences that are part of the economic model that the fans would otherwise help with. Um, but I think there'll be some new revenue opportunities that might get created through this. Um, uh, expanded postseasons, another opportunity um, or a different postseason that might be interesting in all the sports, but specifically in baseball. Uh, but they are working through that now um, as to where they can do that and how many games because they're going to want to try to televise. If they could get some sort of round the clock, that would be ideal. But they're trying to get as many of those games televised as possible when baseball does get going. Got it. I would just add that I think everything's on the table right now um, between the leagues and the networks. Um, but the networks are also feeling some pressure also because advertisers. Um, and so – whether they're going to pay um, an incremental amount of money, I think that would be, we'd have to wait and see on that. But I do think that they're feeling a lot of pressure too. And um, the leagues are, I think, looking at every which way to try to make up that difference. But in, in, in certain sports, that gate is a, is a pretty large percentage. Um, so, these are things that we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but I know one way or another um, that's going to have to be taken into account as you talk about starting next season. Got it. Is there anything good that could come out of this going forward that you can think of? I mean, I've, learned we... how to cook. I've, I've actually learned how to cook pretty well. I've been in the <laughs> kitchen a lot. Um, and that aside, which is the most important thing, secondarily related to the sport that you're involved in. I mean, you know how like the world now, like we're doing this Zoom thing, you know, the world is changing as a result of this. The question is, will it change pro sports forever to some degree? And could any of those changes be actually good in, for the players and the, for the players, let's just say. Yeah, I don't, uh... Uh, David, I, I, I think we, as a society, always live as a, a prisoner of the moment. Um, I do. Uh, I've tried not to as much. Um, two of these guys on this call try to make sure I don't do that as much. But uh, I, 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 uh, <clears throat> I think it's incumbent upon us as leaders, and I, I, we put you in that same category. You're, you're a distinct leader in what you do uh, to figure out what that what the good is that comes out of this how do we um, how do we uh, make sure that we're better coming out of this than anybody else and um, I don't think anybody has the answer to that right now uh, but I do know that we think about it every day I know I talk to my athletes uh, about it every day along with my partners here. I know you talk to your doctors about it and, um, and, and we will. And, and that's why we'll continue to be Excel sports and you'll continue to be hospital for special surgery um, because we will uh, challenge the people on this call and we'll challenge the people that work for us to determine the, the, what it looks like on the back end and we don't know if we're on the front or the middle or, or entering the back end but um, we, we are we are figuring that out from a from a golf perspective um, you know we are able to practice social distancing a little different than a lot of the other sports and so um, I'm hopeful that that gives you know Adam Silver or Rob Manfred or Michelle Roberts or Tony Clark or who, whoever, whomever it may be, um, some learnings. And, um, and we'll see what happens, hopefully starting, you know, in the coming weeks. Uh, you know, one, one big, maybe overall positive is that it's giving both baseball and the NBA 
a chance to look to look at things, right, Casey? You could say in baseball, you're looking at maybe changing the schedule, changing some things up, make making maybe a more dynamic postseason, uh, giving different ideas to looking at the demographics of baseball. Is there a way to change the game and do some things that might make the regular season more interesting and the postseason more interesting? And in basketball, thing they're looking at is this the time maybe instead of starting in the fall we now start in december because now we don't we don't go up against base uh, go up against football in, in the nfl in the spring excuse me in the fall and then we can play into the summer when we could have more summer games day games more kids coming to games so it is giving the leagues a chance to look at new opportunities and and re-envisioning how schedules go I think, I think that's right, Jeff. I think that uh, all the sports will probably, it might be too soon, as Mark said, to, to basically say what will come out of this. But I think there will be some good, um, whether sports are too long or they're too short or they're too boring or there's too much of this or too many or too few playoff teams. I think there will be some things that uh, will find the right balance to almost out of necessity, which is obviously the motherhood of invention, that will get to where we'll end up wanting to be. And some of these changes will be things that have forced us, just like in our own personal lives, everything that's taken place over the last eight to 10 weeks have forced us to change some behavior, a lot of it for the good. Uh, and I think a lot of that will be the same result in the sports, which would, what we'll see over the next coming weeks and months, and certainly over the next few years. You know, one, one interesting question is, do you think there's a big difference in the sport among the athletes in their feeling about playing in front of fans or not. And obviously I'm looking at you, Mark, when I'm thinking that like maybe golfers don't even want the fans there because they're annoying and they get in the way and, and baseball players and basketball players feed off the energy more, but I, I don't know. So maybe you guys could shoot that question around a little bit. You know, David, let me, let, you know, I'll, I'll turn to you case, but um, you know, Golf's had a, a little bit of an experience. Funny, um, last year, very few people, if any, uh, will ever recall this. You will because you're an avid uh, golf fan. But, you know, Tiger won uh, in Japan last October at the Zozo Championship. And the Saturday round, because of a massive storm that came in, had no fans. And um, the players were kind of like, yeah, this is – kind of nice. I think it was nice for one day, but they also feed off the energy. So I, I think they're trying to understand, I hate using the term new normal because everybody's using it, but whatever we come out of this on, they're just going to adjust to it because they have to. And golf has already decided we're going to come out for the first four weeks, starting the week of June 8, no fans whatsoever, and then adjust from there. Um, so I think the interesting one is going to be October, assuming golf continues, October or September, Ryder Cup in the States, in Wisconsin, heart of the Midwest, passionate fans. Um, and um, I just, uh, you know, how do you play? People ask me all the time, how do you play a Ryder Cup if there are no fans? And um, because that is where, the Ryder Cup, you know, I, I don't want to over sensationalize it, but it's MLB playoffs. It is Western Conference finals, maybe finals. Like it is the crux of just fandom. So it'll be, it'll be interesting, but it's, uh, uh, I don't think there's any sport that would prefer no fans versus fans. Yeah, I would say in, in the world of uh, professional baseball, certainly it's going to be difficult because it's a grind. You play 162 games. Obviously, we're not going to play that many this year. Uh, but to go out into, for instance, if they were thinking about starting in Florida or Arizona, where you're talking about 100 degree temperatures, you've been quarantined for two or three weeks, you go out to play, you go to the yard, you simply play in front of no fans, you know, drawing that energy, drawing that spirit, that competitive fire is, a, is going to be a little harder. I think that's why they wanted to make sure if they could, you know, they could do it in those home ballparks and it would be a little better. I think the home ballparks are also equipped and I'll give them a lot of credit. And that's throughout all of sports and the people that run the teams. Um, I'm sure they're working on things now to your question about what could be better. 
you know, piping in crowd noise, piping in energy. I mean, there's going to be abilities yeah. to do that, right? They're, they're already thinking of those ways to, to make the game. Well, you won't have somebody get hit. I mean, maybe one of the benefits that people won't get hit by foul balls. People won't get hit by broken bats that shatter into the stands. Um, some of those things that are the negative, uh, they can remove the netting, um, all that sort of thing. But I do think that there'll be some innovative ways that teams try to create that energy on behalf of their, uh, their clubs to kind of give them some home field advantage. I think that the NBA players probably have to have the biggest mind shift with that because they're the ones so connected to the fans. Like you're sitting courtside, you're, they're, they're right there on top of them. Um, and I think they've, they've been going through that because when I, we've talked to our players, at first it was like, it doesn't make sense to play without fans. And now it's, okay, I understand it. It's gonna be really weird. To play without fans, and I think Casey's right. The ideas of piping in, piping in, <laughs> piping in some type of emotion into the arenas is going to be something that I think they're going to experiment with, um, and that maybe it helps the games. You know, who knows where these games could even be played this summer or when the season starts? It doesn't have to be in a big arena. It could be in some small, you know, some small. Uh, arena, whether it's a college arena or a high school arena, different camera angles. Maybe they're really on top of the players, the cameras, and they pipe in noise. We just don't know. But I think it was a really big mind shift for the, uh, for the NBA players to think, think through playing without fans. Hey, hey, David, I'll give you your first big idea of the day, right? Here it is. You can own a virtual seat license. Therefore, you can actually sit center court and have an avatar of yourself at a game every day they, they sell you the virtual seat license, and you can control all that inventory throughout the NBA and throughout Major League Baseball. Love that, Case. That's the kind of stuff I was looking for. Great. That's good. Um, you know, last, last topic that I have, you know, obviously because it relates to my businesses and, you know, it lurks in the background, inadequate preparation, in, in, in irregular preparation and increased injury. Uh, you know, obviously I'm not portending that that's going to happen. Um, but if it does happen, what, what do you think the effect will be? Everybody will just roll with it or there'll be like a huge backlash. You know what, let me back that up a little bit. Cause I think what you're asking, there, there's, there's one more step to it. If the leagues decide they're going to go back and play this summer, I mean, baseball hopefully will play. Let's say the NBA decides to finish. You might have players that are just going to be worried about, forget the injury part, just worried about getting back on the floor and, and playing and being worried about the safety of, of just that. So once, I mean, that, I think that's going to be an issue unto itself. Um, some players saying, don't want, don't want to do this. Um, and I think that the leagues, they're going to have to think about that, how to, how to handle that stuff and without being too draconian. Um, but what a, what a lot of guys have talked about, it, if we don't have enough time to practice, players are going to get hurt. They're going to get back on the floor and they're going to get hurt. So they are thinking about that. And I think that the union's going to have to do a good job of making sure that there literally is enough time to practice whether it's individually at first and then as a team at first, and then maybe there's some exhibition games where the players are getting, because you can't go from zero to a hundred, no matter how much you practice, there's no speed. Like when you go play an NBA game versus playing a practice game, it's not the same thing. Um, and there is a lot of concern on that. And so the agents and the union are, are talking about that. I, we don't have an answer yet how long the players are going to need for preparation, but it is something we're all thinking about. Great. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? I'll just take a brief stab at it as well. So I think in the Major League Baseball, the, the, two, the two ends of the spectrum are the, the player who has done well for himself, has already gone through free agency a couple times, has made an extraordinary amount of money. And that player is looking at this summer and saying, well, do I really even want to go through all this kind of stuff? I'm going to make a ton of sacrifices. The possibility of spending not only weeks, but possibly months away from their family to play half a season. Um, what do I really get out of this kind of stuff? Um, it, it, so that's one end of the spectrum. The other end is the player who may be a potential free agent, 
and is going to go out and be asked to rush through a season and put his best performance where halfway through the season, maybe he suffers an injury that's related to not being as prepared as he would have been. So exactly. that's a big deal. And that's a big yeah. problem. And, and does that, where does that guy now fit? This is his one chance for free agency over the course <clears throat> of his entire career. And now, you know, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars are at stake on either side of that. So, yes, I think we're, there's going to be a lot to do with preparation. I think Major League Baseball and the Players Association is carefully considering expanded rosters, uh, making sure players do have downtime, not trying to play 100 games in 100 days if that's what it ends up being. Uh, they're carefully considering all that. But you have players on both ends of that spectrum, depending on where they are in their careers. You know, right. David, it's, it's interesting. Um, I know golfers, they are athletes. Um, and uh, so, but, but I, you know, uh, the commissioner, uh, you know, issued a, a fairly early statement about uh, when we intend to come back to golf, as we talked about earlier. And uh, part of that was to be able to get the, the guys going and practicing at facilities that are open. Uh, and the other, you know, which is a, a little less um, of, a, of a, an alarming factor for what Casey and Jeff are going through is our sport is truly global. Not, not that baseball and basketball aren't, but on the PGA Tour, there are players all over the world that um, live all over the world. And so got to figure out how to get, and we represent some of them, how to figure out how to get them in place. Is there a 14-day quarantine? Where are you going to get to? So there are a lot of factors, not just on getting your body right, which Casey and Jeff alluded to, but there's a lot of just logistical factors as to how do I even put myself in a position to be able to be able to compete? You know, we're an independent contractor sport. So a player can say, I'm not comfortable with that and I'm not going to play. And it doesn't affect the Lakers or the Marlins or whoever it may be. Um, it just affects themselves. So we don't have that team aspect to it all. Um, we have a bit more of a logistical aspect um, of getting, you know, people from place to place. Thank you. That was good. So I guess I, I, I lied. I do have one more question. Sorry. Um, and it's good that we don't have an NFL agent here. I mean, and the NFL, as far as I saw, now it's like business as usual. I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think that's realistic? Do you think that's just blowing smoke? What's your opinion on that? I think they were in a position early on when this, when this whole um, pandemic broke that it was going to be six months away from kind of their opening day. And they were at the ability to kind of skate for a little while. They had to worry about the draft, which obviously took place a couple of weeks ago in the virtual draft. Um, but I think as this gets closer and they realize what they're going to have to do and, you know, the, the tackling and just the, the nature of the game itself, right? Players are on top of each other. They're hitting each other. Like this is, it's 24 seven. I, I think they're going to have to take a really close look based upon the guidelines of what they can see to say, all right, you, you can't, you can mock a practice all you want. You can kind of do it, but on Sundays or Saturdays in college football, you actually have to hit somebody. That's what the game is all about. So I, I don't think people want to watch flag football. And I think that's just going to be something that they're going to have to take a very hard look at. I think they're probably hoping for some sort of good news on the medical front, some great news on the testing front, uh, possibly even news on the vaccine front, right? I, I think that they don't have to make a decision yet. But no doubt, Roger Goodell and his team, as well as D. Smith and the players, uh, there's got to be a plan B and a plan C at this point because um, it's going to fast approach when we get to September. I would say this also. You're seeing the NFL make some adjustments, some salary uh, adjustments to staff at the league office at, with, with teams. So they're, they're starting to think about it. I just saw something. The Dolphins came out with a plan. I don't know, David, if you saw this. The Dolphins came out with a plan to be able to put 15,000 people in their arena. Their, their stadium holds 60, 60 or 65,000. And the way they would do it would be, so they're thinking about how can we play, 
get some fans into the arena, but I do think they're the bigger issues that Casey's talking about, about it's, I mean, as much of a contact sport as basketball is, football is really the contact sport. And they're going to, they've got, they're going to have a lot of issues if they, I don't think they're just going to be able to move forward until they get some more guidance on, but they didn't have to make these decisions yet. That's right. They have the benefit of time, right? Uh, and it's only based on scheduling. But, you know, David, one of the things we, we haven't talked about before we go is, um, you know, you're, you're unselfish here, but what you guys have done, what HSS has done, and um, how you've kind of turned the hospital into a front line to, uh, to take care of, of people. And... Um, you know, it should be, you know, it should be noted um, because, you know, doctors and nurses and hospital workers, I mean, you guys have done, um, everybody has done an amazing job and uh, we'd be remiss not to acknowledge that uh, and how appreciative the world is um, that not just, you know, in a normal world, you guys bring people back to a state of recovery and getting back to their life. But, um, you know, now you've, you've turned your hospital into a different type of hospital. So, you know, we, I think everybody thanks you and HSS and everybody that works with you and around you for that. Well said, Mark. Really well said, except for the part where you're including me because I didn't do anything. And, uh, but it's, I, I appreciate, the comments are greatly appreciated and we you know, should take a second to salute the CEO, Lou Shapiro, the, the Surgeon Chief, Brian Kelly, and the numerous staff members and staff, the word staff includes not just the doctors, obviously the nurses, the people that clean the building, the engineers, all of whom, I mean, HSS turned into a COVID care hospital for very sick patients who were very contagious. And these people showed up for work every day, did a great job. And in fact, there's some statistic where we might have had the best rate of recovery from intubated patients of any unit in the country, possibly in the world. And that speaks to the level, individual level of care. So thank you for saying that. And I'm, you know, but that's awesome. That's, that's I, you know, really I, I had nothing to do with it except for cheering from 3,000 miles, you know, 1,700 miles away or whatever, uh, whatever I am. But the hospital did a great job and the leadership of the hospital should be saluted. So thank you. All right. Well, uh, unless you guys have any other comments, I think this has been, uh, I've learned a lot. And it's a, it's a really interesting time. So um, I'll, be, I'll be driving up to see you for a social distancing hello any day now. <laughs> okay. I'll look forward to that. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you David, great to see okay. you. Thanks for having right. us today. David, good right. to see you. Stay Thanks for everything. Be well. All right. You too. Look forward to it. Right. See you. Bye-bye.